Pattern matching in Python was something that was introduced all the way back in Python 3.10, but I haven't really used it that much. Um, a lot of the time I've done personal projects, they've supported earlier versions of Python. And even until somewhat recently at work, we use Python 3.9. Um, so I hadn't actually used it that much. I did uh, at work uh, use it recently and I do have that example here. So that's why I'm talking about them now. The match statements are really, really nice to use, especially if you use them in the right situations. And we're gonna be talking about that in this video. Before I go any further, I do wanna address the lack of face cam intro very quickly. Uh, there's not gonna be one for this video and there is not gonna be any for the foreseeable future. This is a temporary thing. Um, my time to record is a lot less than it was just a few months ago. Uh, and so to save on a little bit of time, I'm not doing the face cam intros anymore, but the rest of the videos should stay around and hopefully they will go back to being somewhat regular. I know I've taken a bit of a, a break I wasn't meaning to take, um, but I'm back now and we'll see how long it lasts, I guess. But yeah, back to if statements, as I said, you need Python 3.10 and above. So if you're using 3.9 and below, you can't use it yet, then maybe this video will incentivize you to upgrade a little bit because you should be on newer versions of Python anyway. Uh, but to show it off, I am going to do just a very simple example. Let's say we had a, a variable color and this was red. Uh, and then say, for example, say this was an input. Obviously, it's not an input, but say it was. Um, we could then, oh, let me turn my AI off. There we go. That's not going to get in our way anymore. Uh, so if we were to have a simple if statement to say that if the color equals uh, I thought it turned it off. Apparently I haven't. So apparently Copilot wanted a bit of the action as well. I thought I was using the windsurf one. Apparently the Copilot one is also active. Who knew? Um, but they're both off now. So we're out of distractions. Uh, but if we were to have a simple if statement say if color uh, double equals red like that and just say like print the color is red just like this really simple example and if we were to do l if there and then if the color was blue then we say the color is blue and if it's neither of those two things we do print the color is not red or blue very very simple example this is how you would do it in an if statement so this isn't the match statements obviously so you have your if l if and then else clauses here if you were to recreate this in a match statement, we would have match color here. And this would be kind of the only time that we would use color because other than that, we have cases and we can say case red, a new line again, print the, uh, the color is red. And then I can do the same copy paste I did before and do blue. And then that's not what I wanted to do. I want to do that. There you go. And our default is an underscore. We'll come back to that in a second. Uh, so not red or blue. Uh, so in this instance here, we have matched the color. And then in the case that color is red, so we're not uh, specifying the variable name every time. We print the color is red, same as we do up here. In the case that it's blue, we print the same thing. And in the else case, which is just an underscore, we can print the color is not red or blue. And these two uh, statements do exactly the same thing. One uses the standard uh, if elif and the other uses the match. About a year ago, and I can't see it would have changed all that much since then, uh, I did a video comparing the performance of if statements and match statements and found that if statements were ever so slightly faster than match, but it was pretty negligible. Uh, in this particular instance, you would actually probably not opt to use a match statement. Um, I did it this way in this example, just to show a really simple example, but match does tend to excel in the more complicated examples. Uh, so we will get to those. I just wanted to show a simple one to show off the syntax, but match really comes into its own if you want to check more than one thing uh, at the same time. So if we do fruits.py uh, and then we have fruit uh, equals apple, and then color equals red. And this is another illustrative example. I do have a real world example coming up. Um, and I'm just gonna copy paste the if elif example here because I don't wanna spend ages typing this. So in this case, it's very similar. We're just checking two things. 
Um, so we have if fruit equals apple, we would expect the color to be either red or green. I'm not aware of any other colors of apples. Maybe you can, in this example, you can't. And if the color is red or green, then we have an apple. If the fruit is a banana, if the color is yellow, you have a banana. I don't know why that's an F string. Um, there we go. Uh, otherwise, if the color is purple, uh, then we have a different message. You have a purple banana. They do exist. They're just quite rare. Um, or they're grown in a very specific way. I forget the exact specifics. Uh, but if it's not a yellow or purple banana, it's not a red or a green apple, our program has no idea what we're talking about and ask us uh, if we're sure about that. This is, of course, ignoring the existence of other fruits. Uh, however, you can actually simplify this a lot with match statements. You've got this kind of nested if and then if thing here and an if and an if if here. We can do match and then we can do fruit and then color. And if we say that the case uh, apple red or apple green. So we're saying the case here that if fruit is apple and color is red or, and this is where we use our pipe, we don't use the or keyword here. Um, we have fruit, apple, color, green. We can print uh, you whoops, have an apple like that. Otherwise, if we have a case where the uh, banana is yellow, uh, then I'm going to bring this down and then we say you have a banana and we'll change that to a banana, not an banana. And then I'm getting all my keyboard shortcuts confused. If we set this to be purple, we have obviously a different message. So we want this to be uh, a different case. Uh, and then again, in your else case, you would have a case and an underscore. And we would print, are you sure Oops, about, oh, I can't type, my microphone's in the way of the keyboard, that. So again, these two uh, bits of code, so this and this, do exactly the same thing, just in very different ways. And you can see that the match statement is a lot cleaner. It's a lot clearer what you're trying to do. Um, you can see just from this one line that if you want a red apple or a green apple, um, and then you can have your other cases down here, as many cases as you want. And you have your case uh, underscore here. It's worth saying as well that if I were to do something like banana and then an underscore here, uh, you and I would do have a have a weird banana. If you wanted us to accept a, a banana of any color, then this wildcard underscore could be used in either of these things. So if we have a banana that's yellow, we print this. If you have a banana that's purple, we print this. If you have a banana that is any other color, we print this. And I can just show this off very quickly. Um, if I were to do, if I get rid of that and then say banana and then green or well, actually the bananas can come in green don't know if they're not ripe um and then if i were to do i don't know why that's there that um so we've gone through these matches we've seen there is a banana but it's not yellow or purple it is some other color and we have a weird banana um so that's another power of the match as well it's always good to keep in mind that the underscore can be pretty much anything i believe it's called the wild card and now that we have an idea of how this sort of thing works, I want to show you the real world example that I used it for. Um, so this is uh, well, this is a, a system at work that looks at this api.postcodes.io and basically performs postcode validation. We store uh, the postcodes of clients and we want to make sure that they actually exist and we use the postcodes.io API to do that. Um, and I wanted to get kind of a little bit funky with the error messages. I wanted to to make things very clear. I learned while I was doing that, you can actually have terminated postcodes. So for those that don't know, a terminated postcode is one that used to exist, but now doesn't. So Royal Mail has decided that the postcode doesn't exist anymore and has moved other buildings into different postcodes. And I wanted to be able to go into that level of granularity. So if a client put in a postcode that they thought was correct, but actually wasn't anymore, um, then it would show, it, it wouldn't say that it was an invalid postcode, that it would actually tell them the postcode no longer exists and they would need to change it um, just to kind of try and reduce a few support queries. 
so I came up with this postcode status enum. If you don't know what enums are, I did a video. Uh, we have this postcode status function. It takes a postcode and it makes the request this terminated postcodes endpoint. Um, and I did this because you can actually tell the difference between an invalid postcode and a live postcode based on the error message you get back, which is a bit strange, but it works in our favor. And this uses a dictionary, so you can actually do this funky thing with dictionaries too. So we have this resp.json, and this is the entire response from the query. And then we can just pass this dictionary with a status key and a value of 200. And you don't need to pass the whole dictionary. You don't need to pass any sort of wildcard characters. Uh, Python will see this and it will check if the, the status key is value 200. And in this case, if it is, it's a terminated postcode. Otherwise, if the status is 404, um, there was a problem with the query, but the error message, as I said, is able to be enough to determine what the behavior should be. So if the status is 404 and the error is invalid postcode, then it's an invalid postcode. However, if the status is 404 and the error is terminated postcode not found, then it's a live postcode. It's one that actually does exist. Um, and that's kind of the key difference there. And this is why I wanted to use the match because it's really simple to just um, do a conditional based on this different error message. If I wasn't doing this with the match statement, it would look very similar to something like this, um, where I just have all these nested ifs all over the place. And that is just really not very nice. So I have some examples down here. Uh, these are examples that are just generated. I believe they're the first postcodes of any given area. Um, so not designed to be any specific postcodes of any locations I know or anything like that. Uh, but if you run this now, so if I do postcodes.py, um, I need to activate the venv. Uh, that would probably help. <laughs> there we go. If run that again. There we go. We see uh, that this one is live, this one is invalid, and this one is terminated. So we're able to uh, get this idea about what's live, what's invalid and what's terminated and that helped with the use case that I explained before. And I forgot to mention actually we have this case underscore. If the response doesn't match either of these three conditions then we don't really know what's gone on and we just say the status is unknown and then it's just a generic error message back to the client. So that is my run through of match statements. If you have any questions or anything then make sure to leave them in the comments below. And if you found this video helpful at any point, then consider liking and subscribing if you want to see more videos like it. Um, speaking of seeing more videos, if you want to see more ways that Python is awesome, then you can watch the Python is awesome playlist that I have linked in the end cards. And I'll see you in the next one for whatever we do next. And actually, I'll give a little spoiler for those that got to the end of the video. The next video is looking at the Python 3.14 beta. So if you're excited about that in any way, then make sure to tune in next week.